as the mom of a, like within the last year, I found out my daughter is gay. So it was a really interesting uh, time for me. I was excited to see your book, Raising LGBTQ Allies. And I, I was wondering, first I wanted to just ask you about the impetus. What made you want to write this book? Yeah, a lot of reasons. I think I've heard before that each of us, we all have a book inside of us. And so I feel like this was percolating in me for a very long time. And what really was the kind of the final answer to the book was I was at home visiting my family. I live in California. My family lives in Arizona. And I was there, ironically, giving a workshop at the Arizona Equality and Justice Conference, which, which is an LGBTQ related conference. And I went home after the conference was over and my mom had a, it was a big family function at my house. And a lot of my family was over there. I have a large family and my nephew, like all kids do, he was running around playing and he just had the thought, ran over up to me. And I was sitting next to a childhood friend of mine who's female and he ran up to me and, and whispered and his version of whispering, he was eight at the time. Was out, was talking out loud. <laughs> and so he whispered slash talked out, spoke out loud, uncle Chris, is she your girlfriend? Mm -hmm. And then I just, it was like one of those moments in time where everything slows down. And I just, I was kind of caught off guard by his question. I, I was surprised by everyone else's reaction. Um, I, I got embarrassed cause I, it, it was a question that completely caught me off guard. And so then later that night, I started to think like, why did my nephew ask if I had a girlfriend? I just kind of thought he already knew I was gay. I've been out his entire life. And I, I moved to Los Angeles to work for an LGBTQ related organization. I was in Arizona giving this con workshop at a conference. And so then I started to ask parents the next day, parents in my life, my mom even. Um, and my mom's response actually was, oh, Chris, they're not old enough to understand. And hmm. That's what I realized, oh, there are nuances to this conversation. And so I started to, you know, ask my sister and, and friends of mine who had, who had kids. And a lot of them said, you know, well, I want to talk to them. I just don't know what to say, or I don't know what an age would be a good starting mm -hmm. point. So then that kind of propelled me on this path of diving in and researching all this information. And then that, and then I ended up writing a letter to my family because we have a lot of young kids in our family. And I realized that by them not considering that their kids could be LGBTQ, mm -hmm. we're, we're perpetuating the closet, which the closet is a hotbed for shame. Myself, I was in the closet my entire childhood. And so the effects of that can be pretty harmful. So mm -hmm. I was wanting to prevent that before it began. And then that letter ended up being published on the Huffington Post and turned into a TEDx talk. And then the book and that, and the rest is history. Oh, awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. And if you think you have a bunch of nieces and nephews, the chances are one of them could be gay and then they don't even under understand that this is a, a possibility in life. That's a lot of ignorance there for those kids to be in. Were you, how were you raised? Were you like raised in a family that was conservative or I don't know, how would you gauge that for and knowing obviously times were different, but yeah, I don't even know that it's ignorance. I think that it could be ignorance. I think that there are a lot of families who they want to support their kids and they want to do the best job that they can. And they just don't know what they don't know. And that's really, no, I meant the kids were ignorant of you yeah, because they weren't informed. I didn't mean to, I wasn't trying to insult your relatives. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I hope to do is to really help people understand kind of their blind spots when it comes mm. to parenting and teaching. I've been a teacher teaching social emotional learning for six years. And it's like, we have to really explore our own blind spots, our biases so that we can show up for kids and not make assumptions, but we don't know. We live in a, one of the things too, with my book is I really talk about heteronormativity and it's like a fish swimming in water. A fish doesn't know that it's in water. And yeah. so really not even realizing that, oh my gosh, like I have to have these proactive conversations and really be curious about who my, my, my kid is so that I don't just assume something based on these unconscious heteronormative assumptions. Yeah. And that's all, it can be like a hard ask, but it's, if you're in that water, you're just assume we, if you 
were raised in a heteronormative culture and you're, you don't know anyone, you may not know anyone who's gay, you may not know anyone who's trans. And then to, people don't make that, people don't like question that about kids. Could they be gay or not? They, they don't assume that. It's interesting. My, I, for me, like this was like, I, I thought about that when my kids were little and I remember telling them, yeah, men can marry men and women can marry women. And I remember my two daughters were three months, three years apart. My youngest daughter said, oh, can I marry Maggie then? Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, yeah. oh, that's so sweet. But yeah. no, you can't. And, but it was interesting. So I felt like I was like, really, like I had explored some of these questions you're asking people to explore. And then, and then as our, as kids got older, like I, I realized like confronted by other people around me and other kids going through their own, their own changes and explorations and et cetera, that I could see, oh, like I, I have an issue with this. Isn't that interesting? Like <laughs> what's going on here? It's really, I think it, I, I think the sort of explosion in how the world has changed so much has changed things a lot, but then it's also like making us look at in a lot of ways, like, oh, what are the biases we hold? Yeah. Yeah. I love that ex example and kind of explanation is one of the analogies that I love giving when I teach classes with the young people I work with, <clears throat> I always say, okay, what if your parents ask you to clean your room? And they're going to, you, you had company coming over in a half an hour. And so they told you to, you know, go in and clean your room. And so you run in your room and you start to pick up the clothes and dust off the shelves and pick up your room and, and it's getting closer to the time and, and your room's clean. And then you look under the bed and you realize, oh my gosh, underneath my bed is all the, you know, dirty clothes and leftover snacks. My, my niece herself, she put stuff under her bed. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and then your parents come in the room and they look. Oh my gosh, your room's clean. You cleaned your room, but you know that underneath the bed is still dirty. So is, can you technically say your room's clean? Mm -hmm. And it's this invitation for me, what I feel like is going on societally is when we get to clean under our bed and that's the exploration of our biases and our assumptions that we make as we are looking underneath our bed when we yeah. do that and really getting in there and clean, cleaning them out. Yeah, I think that's important, it, but it's interesting because I guess before we look into that, like thinking about thinking, it's interesting because we think about like how things have changed so enormously and like we can think about it's normal, it's it, LGBTQ lifestyle is normalized now yet yeah, in a lot of ways or LGBTQ, be, what are, I, I probably am going to use lots of the wrong words, Chris, you could just have to like, help me yeah, out here. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the fears people have about talking about these things, right? Is that we're going to say the wrong words, but like that things have changed so enormously, but there's also been this backlash, right? It seems like there's been this huge backlash like Florida, the whole don't say gay bill, all the anti-transgender laws and things like that. Maybe you could just give us before we keep going, what are some of the challenges right now that LGBTQ people have to deal with? What are the issues yeah, they're yeah. contending with? Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate you saying too, that people, and that's one of the things I talk about in my book is that parents, sometimes they don't want to say something because they fear what to say. They fear getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to be mindful. And one of the chapters of my book, I really talk about how words matter. Mm -hmm. And when we use words over and over to describe certain communities, that's where these subconscious biases mm -hmm get rooted and then that's the worldview that we perceive people in and mm -hmm. that's what creates the difference and so when it comes to kids my one of my hopes with my book is i really center children's experiences and my hope is to really get on their level and what it's like being an lgbtq kid in a classroom in a family in a community and their kids are like sponges they pick up everything and mm -hmm. when they're they're constantly looking for affirmation. They're constantly looking for, to know that they're, they're okay. And they fit like, in the tribe, right? That's tribe. an incredibly important human drive is yeah. to be accepted into the tribe because otherwise yeah. evolutionarily that would mean death. And words like lifestyle, words like issues to describe LGBTQ, the LGBTQ community, what issues and constantly there's that's one of the things i i tackle in, in the first chapter of my book is the dsm-5 which is the mental health 
kind of how you're described with mental illness, diagnosed with a mental health condition, and just the history of sexuality, homosexuality being considered a, a mental health disorder, and also connected to gender dysphoria, which is another diagnosable condition that is convoluted with folks who are non-binary, gender non-conforming, gender diverse. What is gender dysphoria for the listener who doesn't know what that means? So gender dysphoria would be a diagnosable, you would need to meet criteria and you have specific things that you feel not connected to your body and you're suffering mental health conditions as a result. So higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of depression, it's, a, it's an effect on your mental well-being and daily functioning. So that might occur if someone were like a trans man in a female body, they might feel that those, that would be something that might occur in that circumstance. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And not every person who is transgender, for example, or, <laughs> for example yes, has or experiences gender, dysphor gender dysphoria. So it's not something that mm -hmm. all trans people have gender dys dysphoria, but using it in the DSM-5 could be considered problematic because it's something that is. So it says it's a pathology. See, yes. It's pathologized. Exactly. Okay. So that's my hope with really having these conversations is to be able to unpack and explore because that's connected to the cultural experiences that we're seeing, especially right now with the increased rates of the laws that are popping up across the country, mm -hmm. anti-LGBTQ legislation. And I really, I address that in, in my book about when you have cultural dynamics, this happens throughout history is if you explore just societies, the way that we, we kind of progress is once you have kind of society swinging mm -hmm. one way, just by virtue of gravity, the pendulum swings back around. Mm -hmm. And so we make momentum and progress. And then it's like cleaning up our room. We have to go back through and do one mat, one more pass to get in there and get out the, the deeper layers of stuff. And I feel like that's what we're seeing is there's been a lot of progress. And then naturally, just by cult, virtue of cultural dynamics, you're going to see the pushback. Okay. All right. Cool. But okay. So not issues, but challenges. And I'm curious about the challenges that LGBTQ folks are experiencing now, because for instance, my daughter, who's 15, she, we live in, she lives in a very accepting family in a really pretty like liberal accepting community, like extremely, I would say probably <laughs> for where we live, liberal accepting community. So she, she's, as far as I can tell, as this goes, she seems totally fine with everything, <clears throat> but the, I know that there, that's not the same case for everybody. And I know that there are challenges that come along with, with being LGBTQ that are, are not happening for people who are for kids or that are heteronormative. So maybe you could just share some of those, because I think it's important for parents to understand that when we maybe don't talk about these things with our kids or we don't think my child could be gay or my child could be trans. Like my little kid could later grow up to be discover it, realize that they are gay or trans. They, we don't realize that there are some real serious reper repercussions yeah, and challenges yeah, that kids are going through. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think I appreciate that question because I think it's really important and LGBTQ youth have increased rates of substance use, suicidality, depression, anxiety. And one of going back, back to the original question is the impetus of the book is that I worked at a very large nightclub here in Los Angeles and it happens to be a gay bar. It's very well known. If you come to LA, most people know this place. And I worked there for 11 years and I really saw the effects of trauma, un unhealed trauma, the effects of what it's like growing up in the closet. I mentioned shame. E even if mm -hmm. a child comes out at a young age, there's still a time period that they were in the closet and the closet can serve for safety if the family is not supportive. So there, there, are, there can be some benefits of the closet. What I really want to help people understand is that it's also really a place where constantly you're feeling like something's wrong with you, that you're, you have to hide who you are. And that's like scar tissue that develops this kind of thick, 
like layers that can feel oppressive. And so increased rates of substance use, internalized homophobia, internalized transphobia. Mm-hmm. One of the things, my, my, the subtitle of my book is A Parent's Guide to Changing the Messages from the Playground. And the messages from the playground, that's a through line that I, I use throughout the, the book to describe a metaphor. The, the messages are our subconscious beliefs and the playground is our mind or our collective consciousness. I'm in graduate school right now, finishing up my master's in clinical psychology. And I work at a training site. All my clients are LGBTQ and I, the youngest client I have is 20. The oldest client I have is 63. And one of the things I assess for as a mental health clinician is the degree of internalized homophobia Hmm. because how that manifests is problems with relationships, low self-esteem. When I'm looking at anxiety or depression or mental health conditions, I'm looking at it through an LGBTQ affirmative lens. And so a lot of that is rooted in, it's not just anxiety. It's not just depression. It's anxiety rooted in heteronormativity. It's yeah, that they weren't accepted. That exactly all of that, that and, adds up enormously. Yeah, and that adds up enormously. And so then you start to have in adults. One of the things I I think is really just to give you anecdotally what that looks like, because we're having children. They grow up and they become adults. And if a lot of this stuff isn't normalized or talked about or accepted, then that manifests as an attack on the self. And so mm-hmm. when we get into intimate partner relationships then if that's unhealed, then we can project that onto our partners. So the parts that we don't like in ourselves will project that onto our partner. And so one of the things that I think is really important is that intimate partner violence in non-LGBTQ relationships and intimate partner violence in LGBTQ relationships pretty much are at the same rate. Hmm. LGBT intimate partner violence in the LGBTQ community, the difference is intimate partner violence in the LGBTQ community always occurs in the context of anti-LGBTQ bias. What does that mean? That means internalized homophobia. So basically the societal oppression is introjected into the person and then that's manifesting as an attack on the self, an attack on, on, on a partner. Okay. If you have tiny children right now and you are not thinking anything about these things, this is let what Chris is saying to you be a wake up call because you want your child to be healthy, mentally healthy, emotionally healthy, grounded. We know that mental and emotional health is what will let our child do all the things they want to do in the world and have that confidence in themselves to be able to go out in the world and be who they want to be. That grounding of acceptance from us. And if they, I, I just wanted to pull this out of Chris, right? We need, I think some of us to be scared a little to say, look, This can happen if we don't lay this foundation of acceptance, we can have a lot, we can lay a lot of challenges uh, at the feet of our children. And you may think, oh, this is a fraught issue. My child is too young. I don't want to not talking about it, but there's issues with not talking about it too. Can you talk about that a little bit, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. One of the chapters of my book, it's called Benign Neglect and how not communicating something is still communicating. And that's turning a blind eye and children are so intuitive. They're so, they're like sponges. They absorb everything. One of the title of my TEDx talk is called what children learn from the things we don't say. Mm -hmm. And, and so the conversations that parents don't have, I, I grew up in a, the family disease of addiction is I have a lot of family members who have, have addiction. And as a kid growing up, I knew what was going on in my family, but no one was talking about it. And I observed things. I picked up things. I was very hyper aware. And so what I interpreted is, oh, we don't talk about these things. These are bad. This is shameful. And so the messages that I got were the things that we don't talk about are bad or they're Mm -hmm. wrong or they're uncomfortable. And, and so then my hope is one of the things that I think the most difficult chapter I I wrote was chapter nine in my book, because I really addressed some of the big reasons why people don't want to talk about these subjects with kids is that we think we're talking about sex or sexuality. 
And so what I invite readers to consider is that we're putting our adult constructs of sex and sexuality onto kids. And that's not what this is about at all. This is about talking about a child's normal, natural development. They're developing their gender. They're developing their sexuality right now. I, I recently watched for the first time the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. I've never seen it. I've never seen it? Oh <laughs> I know, it sounds so weird. <laughs> no, I literally just thought for the first time. Yeah, I yeah. just thought for the first time last week. Um, <laughs> It's like a classic movie. A lot, I'm sure a lot of your listeners um, have watched it, but there's a scene that's so sweet and innocent in the very beginning of the movie where the young boy is working at, I think it's like a, a shop or a candy. He's at the, like a, a counter with ice cream and there's a little girl who's waiting for him. And they're probably like, I don't know, eight years old. And she's waiting at the counter and he comes to work and it's clearly like she has a crush on him and another girl enters the store and you see the leather girl at the counter looking at the other girl and she's jealous. And the little boy, part of the storyline is that he can't hear out of one of his ears. So he's getting her ice cream ready and she whispers in his ear, I'm going to love you forever. <laughs> and, and it's just this sweet kind of scene and I'm watching it and I'm thinking that's an example of heteronormativity where we just, that is just, accepted and seen as sweet and innocent and crushes. We all have a crush. Mm -hmm. um, I watched a video last night where the guy was asking people in the audience, when did, when was your first crush? Who was your first crush? And everyone in the audience went around and said who their first crush was. They could remember it when they were little. In oh yeah. Yeah. I held hands with John John Almeida at nap time in kindergarten. Yeah. 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 <laughs> in kindergarten. yeah that, and one of the people in the audience said that too. Oh, I was in kindergarten. And that's my whole, that's what I, my, I desire. My hope is that we can have that same kind of cute, mm. like joy, mm. like right now your face, mm -hmm. if you're the joy that you had in expressing that crush, that same kind of innocent joy for a kid who's LGBTQ as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I would hope we could have that. I don't know if we're there yet, because I think we all have too much internalized homophobia in us. Like yeah. at this point when I was growing up, we definitely, gay was like the most common insult on the sure. playground of for, uh, and through high school, it wasn't even questioned Yeah, at all. Like that was not that long ago. I graduated in 1996. It wasn't like hugely is, and to go from that to your vision in such a short amount of time, I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but I like the vision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think we have, we have to have hope. We have to have hope. Yeah. That's, that's one of the mm -hmm. quotes that I use in my book from Harvey uh, Milk and, and we have to give them hope. And that's the idea is that I think with anything that we, that we care about, whether it's anti-racist work, whether it's the war that's going on, like all of these things, we have to have hope. And that's my hope is that if I can do this work within my own life, mm -hmm. one of the things that I really believe strongly is that we can only take others as far as we've gone ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so as a teacher, as a parent, as an uncle, as a family member, the work that I do in my life is going to impact the next generation. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is. This is really doing the work for the next generation. I think this, this is fascinating. And, and of course, dear listener, this all ties back into mindfulness and awareness, self-awareness. Like we can do zero to change what we're not aware of. And part of self-awareness is like rock on for you. You're listening to this right now, developing your self-awareness. And maybe there are some things coming up for you. Maybe there's some discomfort and that's okay. We can examine that and look at that and let it be our teacher. We don't want to not talk. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah. What, this was a question. So I, I told you, like I said to my mindful mama mentor team, all right, Chris is coming on the podcast. You all have little kids. I've got teens. What are the questions that we have? And one of the big questions, and I'm sure you get it constantly is at what age should parents begin to have conversations about when, what are the conversations we should have? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what I invite parents and caregivers and the people I speak to is this isn't a one size fits all conversation and, and it's not a one time conversation. It's ongoing. And it's my, my invitation to people is to be curious and to listen 
and to ask questions. And my niece, as an example, she, so really quick to address, like at what age, I think that if a child is old enough to ask questions, that's a pretty good ind indication that they're able to take in information at age appropriate levels and start to be curious with them and talk to them and ask them. A lot of times I'll talk to my nieces and nephews about stuff and then I'll mention it to my sister, I'll mention it to my mom and they'll say, they didn't, what? They didn't tell me that. And I feel like it's because I have a genuine curiosity and an interest in, and not that their parents don't, but I feel like the energy that we bring to a conversation with, with a young person is felt. And my niece recently, she's nine years old and she, a few weeks ago, we did a FaceTime and she was telling me about a gender reveal party that she went to. Uh, yeah, what do you think of those? I, it's like a weird, I, it's developed after I had my kids as a yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. It's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was curious to hear from her yeah. what she understood as far uh -huh. as what a gender reveal party was. And what was curious to me is that it was almost like she was just regurgitating information that mm -hmm. like clearly these weren't necessarily her ideas. They were, it was what was told to her about what a gender reveal party was. And so mm -hmm. I started to ask her, what about boys who like pink? And one of the things that I'm sure your readers will, or listeners and readers will understand is that children, when they're very young, they have a very rigid and fixed way of, of thinking. That's just yeah, how like the brain. Age develops. five, I think is peak rigidity. Yeah. That's, that's just how the brain develops. That's mm -hmm. childhood development. I was able to really talk to her and be curious about the conversation and challenge her for the colors of only boys like blue and only girls like pink. And she resisted because of just that kind of more fixed way of, of thinking, but that seed planting to me, this is mm -hmm. answering the question is that we get to have ongoing conversations. And so then a few weeks later, we did another FaceTime and she showed up and she had a blue shirt on and not that even that she was aware of it, but I mentioned, oh, that's, I like your shirt. That's a blue, you're wearing a blue shirt. And she looked down and she remembered the conversation we had. And that was a good kind of example of, oh, girls can blue as well. So it's introducing the conversation at the age that they're starting to tell you things and ask questions and then also be proactive. And I recommend, I love getting kids books, children books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was another question we had on my team was books geared towards children that you find helpful. What are they? Yeah. I have chapter 10 in my book. I include all of my favorite books and they're, they're by ages. What books are there? I definitely recommend books. I think they're so helpful to be able to, that, that's just a really great bonding time that you get to be with a, a young person and flip through and, and read books. I stopped giving my nieces and nephews presents and I would give them, I would give them books. Yeah. I'll just going to share a couple examples because that's helpful for the listener. Chris has books ages two and up, ages three and up, four and up, read a crayon story, love makes a family, I am jazz are in the four and up list, Jacob's new dress, who has what, I love who has what, I recommend who has what all the time mm. because it is a great book for three and up for kids asking questions about their bodies. It's such a great book and, uh, and other ones. Yeah. So there are, are lots of, then, then that's a great, I find that's a great, because if you don't have, maybe you don't have any gay people in your life that you know of, and, and you, maybe you live in a community that's not so friendly to, to LGBTQ people bring some books into your house. Yeah. And that is, a. Uh, a speaker, you know, that talks to, that opens the door for conversations, even when you're, you're not there. And the whole pink and blue thing is so interesting. I was like, so, I, uh, it's it fascinating because in the Victorian era, pink was the color for little boys. It right. actually indicated yeah. little boys and light blue was the color for little girls and it right. switched right. and little boys wear dresses for yeah. a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Probably yeah. a lot easier to like pee if you're a little boy and you have a just a stress on you're just going to lift it up. I imagine probably. it's probably all yeah. practicality. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> or if you live in Scotland, yeah, <laughs> the kilts. Okay, so what age should we begin to have these conversations when they're asking the questions, yeah. or can we? And I think that you're right. Like I personally believe in like 
transparency for kids. Let's teach them about the world we live yeah. in. Like when they ask questions, answer those questions in a way that is comfortable, is age appropriate for them. And we don't have to, we don't have to answer a question with all the information. We can give yeah. a piece of the information and yeah. then see if they have any more questions. Yeah. Maybe just, oh, those two men are holding hands. Maybe they're married and, yeah. and that's all you need yeah. to say. And if they have any more questions, ask yeah. some more, you answer yeah. some more questions. Would yeah. that be, yeah. yeah, he's saying, I, yeah. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I think that again, going back to heteronormativity and just the, just the constant, we take in hundreds of thousands of data of information just through be navigating through the world. We're taking in, taking in information. And if I'd say the majority of that is heteronormative, then just subconsciously kids are getting information, picking up information. And so I remember, I'm sure you, when for your book, you really have to take into mind the reader, like, who is this reader? Who am I writing this book for? And I literally went through and had in mind the specific people in my life who I had conversations with. I remember a good friend of my family friend, her sister's a lesbian and she didn't realize, and she's, she loves her sister and is very accepting. And she didn't realize that whenever her sister would come over, her kids were, I think four and six at the time. And she would refer to her sister's girlfriend as her sister's friend. And she didn't realize that she was doing that. And then when she did tell her girls that her sister was a lesbian and was with, it was her partner. Mm -hmm. The little girl's response was, Ooh, mommy, girls can't kiss girls. And so that kind of was her realization of, oh my gosh, like I have to take these kind of proactive steps because children are just picking up information and that's that ri rigid mm -hmm. construct that they're based, they're basing it off of what their worldview of what they're seeing and experiencing. So would you recommend when kids, I guess it'd be interesting to bring a child development specialist into this, right? Cause like when kids are super rigid, particularly about gender roles, like around age five, cause I remember finding that really interesting because I really chafed against as a feminist, like the ideas that girls should just be this way and boys should just be this way. I wasn't necessarily like looking at it from like an LGBTQ standpoint, but I had my girls wore clothes from the boys section at times and I didn't. I tried to keep the minute, the pink that flowed into our house to a minimum, <laughs> but would you, I wonder if, is, is it a good idea at those times when kids are highly rigid to push back and ask them some questions about whether they think some of those things are true about these, the sort of rigid stereotypes that they are developing just through their own development. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think so. I, I do. And I think that helps that creates for me, that's information gathering Yeah, because I'm helping, I'm getting a glimpse into their worldview and I'm, it's not that I'm telling them to, to think a certain way. It's that I'm challenging how they're thinking. I'm being curious, not what they think, but how they think, like, how are they coming up with these, you know, ideas recently I was in class and the professor asked everyone, what is the percentage of our brain? And the majority of the class said that humans use 10% of our brain. Which is not true. Which is <laughs> not true. It's not true. It's not true. It, and he gave a whole, he's a neuroscience and he gave a whole thing about how, where that myth came from. It, it was from 18, I think 1895 from a French researcher put out a journal article and, and it's still in our conversations today that people believe that we only use 10 percent of our brain i use that anecdotally just to connect it to these kind of unconscious beliefs that we all have that we get to well where did you get that from how like how did you come to think about it that way mm -hmm. all right i think that's I, yeah i think that is so important it, it's interesting I, it's an interesting time because also i think that as a parent of adolescents, and I, there's like a lot of adolescent kids in my community, which I said is like super liberal and artsy and things like that. It's this intentional community. <laughs> We've got, we're like a whole bunch of old hippies started anyway, because kids also I'm, I'm noticing now are like gender and sexuality is a place where they're really 
open and curious and experimenting. And I think that scares a lot of parents. Honestly, the, I it's interesting because I guess we don't know. I think the obviously from the the legislation that's being introduced in a lot of different parts of the country, the idea of having a trans kid scares probably a lot of parents. And they're worried about their kids being influenced by the larger culture to question things and then take some steps that may they're scared that their kids would take some steps that could harm them or re, you know harm their reproductive capacity. They they don't want to they don't want to you know call their have their kid reject the name they were given when you know the whole idea. Personally, think that the idea of calling it like a dead name is so extreme. Can't we call it a former name? Like these parents, I see it from the point of view of the parents who like had X number of years with this child, and then they're saying the name is dead, but it's, I'm curious about that piece, like where we're in this transitionary phase and how parents can walk the middle path. Maybe is there a middle path from between being like between the, of being non-accepting and being, maybe being supporting changes that their child may regret, right? Is there like a middle path between that? What, how do you see this, Chris? Yeah, I do. And I, I talk about that in my book, as far as the phases of acceptance and mm. in my experience, like anything in life, it's not a straight line and it's going to be a certain way and it's going to be perfect and tied up in a nice bow. Life kind of happens on life's terms. And I do believe that kids are the future. And I believe that each generation has something to teach us. And I feel my book is very much a spiritual book. And I believe on a soul level that we each come into this life to, to change something and to, we have a purpose. And I feel like the LGBTQ community kids right now today are teaching us how to be better people. And mm -hmm. it's through the process that we're going through to be able to get there. That's helping us be better humans if we're open to it. Mm. I think there is a middle path. I think absolutely there is. And I think that it's absolutely a parent's, that's part of being a parent is you kind of project into your child a lot of the things that you didn't receive as a kid growing up, or you want to help bring them something that you didn't get and mm. you want them to be a certain way and you have all these hopes and expectations and, and then they're not that way. Yeah. And, and then you have to work through that or hopefully you're able to work through that. Um, and I think that, yeah, even I would say for my daughter, when she keep told me that she was gay, I kind of like called, it would have been a long day. I saw a new brand new rainbow flag over and I was like, Hey honey, are you lesbian? <laughs> I think I called it from the yeah. stairs and she was like, yeah, I thought you knew. And I was like, huh? Anyway, but there was some processing for, I thought it was like, I was like, oh, like there's some processing for me to do with this. I, I accept her completely 150%. At that time, it was like, oh, this was a, a break in my expectation for her sure, yeah. that I didn't even realize I had. Yeah. 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 Thank you for sharing that. Cause I think that really is my, that that's really what the book is for. That's really what this conversation is for. I go to a lot of support meetings. I go to a lot of support groups. P flag for your listeners is a wonderful organization. They have chapters all over the country and I go to a lot of, support what does it stand groups. for? P flag, P flag parents and families. It used to stand for parents and families of lesbian and gays. Okay. It, it's since changed. And so it's parents and family members of the LGBTQ community. And they do support groups, they do advocacy, wonderful organization. And I go to support groups where parents like yourself who are processing their child's coming out and they want to be supportive and accepting. And my hope is down the road that the more that we get to peel away the layers of heteronormativity and kind of these um, unconscious blind spots is that we won't have to process if our child does come out because it mm -hmm. wouldn't have been something that. Yeah. Maybe that, our children won't have to anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and even now though, there is going mm -hmm. back to your question about the middle path, you know, there is phases of acceptance and ultimately the last phase is I hope that parents and caregivers can get to a place of celebration and, and not from a place of, I, I talk about this in my book too, about the difference between when you 
I know in my own experience with young people is that when I bring, t- like when I make something too much of a big deal, like it almost, mm. it almost has an aversive message to them. Yeah. 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 Like we're trying too hard. You want it yeah. to be normalized. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Huh. Interesting. There's probably so many things I could talk to you about <laughs> on this. Chris, we have to let you go. The book is raising LGBTQ allies. Um, so I just want to go over, we want to be having these conversations with kids at the ages. Like we want to, they're asking questions, maybe provide some books to just let them explore in their own time. But I think what I'm hearing from you is that obviously not talking or not talking about it with our kids until they're, I don't know, adolescents or older is giving them a message of that not talking is a message mm-hmm. that that there's something wrong or bad that is giving them that message. And so if you have a toddler, dear listener, and you're listening now and you want your toddler to feel that acceptance no matter who they are, right? No matter what their sexual gender orientation, whatever. And you want you, your intention now as their little is to love them for who they are and have a lifelong positive relationship with them. Then these are the steps that we should take. We want to be allies, no matter who our kids turn out to be. That's a message I'm getting from you, Chris. Yeah, yeah, a- absolutely. And I appreciate being here and I appreciate being able to have this conversation. And I would invite your listeners to consider, I'll leave on one last thing, is that all relationships begin with curiosity. Mm-hmm. All relationships begin with curiosity. And there is a story that I use in my book where a father was talking to his, his daughter and she's a lesbian, came out later in life and they didn't have a good relationship and the father was making amends to her and saying I realized that it wasn't your job to teach me who you were it was my job to understand Mm. and learn who you were and that goes back to all relationships begin with curiosity and the relationships that we have with our kids the people the young people in our lives it can begin with just that curiosity Yeah. Interest, curiosity. It's the opposite on the spectrum from judgment, dear listener, right? Like mindfulness is intentionally being in the present with an attitude of kindness and curiosity. So I love that. I love, love, love that you're ending with that, Chris. That's so beautiful. (laughs) Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, to write that letter to your family, to share your thoughts. I think it's really powerful and it's really needed to approach this conversation from so many angles and and yeah i appreciate you putting this work into the world yeah thank you hunter i appreciate being here and thank you for having me catch new episodes of the mindful mama podcast and other free resources including the mindful mom guide at mindfulmamamentor.com you can listen to every back catalog episode including interviews with dr dan siegel Ianla van zant sharon salzberg and get meditations, join our private Facebook group, and more. Go to mindfulmamamentor.com now. I'll see you there.